Welcome to the Connected Families Podcast, your listening guide to parenting with peace and connection. I'm Stacey Bellward, here with co-founder of Connected Families, Jim Jackson. Welcome, everyone. We're glad you're here with us today for the Connected Families Podcast. I'm Stacey Bellward, and here with me is Jim Jackson. Hi, Stacey. Hi. It's fun to be here. This is a good series so far. What do I do when my child does this thing I don't like? What should I do when my child says no? What should I do when my child lies? <laughs> yeah, that was a big one. What should I do when I feel hopeless and mm. just in despair? We covered that one. So I'm sure listeners are already in great suspense. What's today's what should I do when question? Uh, right. Today's question is what should I do when my tween will not get ready for school on oh, time? that never happens. <laughs> it happened to me this morning. <laughs> it did? It did. And, and uh, you've been a part of Connected Families for a while. How'd that go for you? <laughs> Well, I've learned a lot in my four years yeah. here, and I felt like I did dealt with it pretty well. Okay, so we're going to cover some ideas today, right? And we've invited Chad again That's from right. our staff to come in and talk through this issue with us. Chad spends a whole bunch of time with parents of teens. Yep. Glad to be here. Welcome, Chad. Thanks for having me. Chad coaches parents every single week. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist. So you have a lot of experience from your so coaching. So much sage wisdom we're looking forward to in well, the next 20 yes, minutes. Chad. It's not just coaching, right? I'm a parent. Yeah. So <laughs> you mean your kids never gave you any so you trouble had perfect with this? children. Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, I, I coach myself through all these situations uh-huh. so that I can help you too, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness, right? All right. the feelings. What should I do when my tween will not get ready for school on time? There's a lot there, but we like to start off each episode with a quick answer. Yeah. So my tween uh, is not getting ready for school on time. And even the question just says, will not, right? Mm. And so I don't know if this is about defiance or, so I'm, I really want to try to get underneath that a little bit about, is this a problem the child's having or is this a willful choice that they're not going? But all of that to say, almost regardless, uh, in some cases, I would I would suggest that the natural impact is what is going to be the greatest teacher here. Mm. So if you're late for school, what is the natural impact of your tardiness? If you are not getting to the places that you're supposed to be on time, uh, what happens without us as parents even having to really do anything to create a, a consequence above and beyond that? Yeah. Then I would suggest the natural impact for being late for school is you get tardies and you get so many tardies and you end up getting some sort of call from a teacher or principal or somebody else, and there's mm-hmm. some consequences that are already set up in place that I don't have to uh, I don't have to put into place for the learning to happen. So I hear you saying that the quick answer when your child won't get ready for school or isn't ready for school on time is to let the natural impacts roll out. Correct. And uh, I think that's a, as you said, natural impacts are the great teacher. But if I'm a parent, and that means that I have to start paying a price because it means I've got to take time out of my day to give a child a ride, or I've mm-hmm. got to enlist somebody else. I've got to, you know, sacrifice some equity in a relationship with somebody to call them and get some help because I got to go this way and the school is that way. I mean, there's like, wait a minute, what are, are you, you talking so- about here? I got to get this kid out the door. I don't have time for this natural impact stuff. Are you? So- saying it's more complex than that? <laughs> than my than my quick and easy answer? Well, I don't I'm not sure yet. I'm going to wait for your sage wisdom to help me unpack it. I think the answer is still the answer, but how right. we as parents think about that, what is the natural impact and help our kids understand what those natural impacts are is not something we can necessarily figure out in a heartbeat, but the more right. advanced thinking we do about it, the more we can let the natural impacts guide this child, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the backup answer, you know, let's back this thing up a little bit and uh, and then maybe move forward with it. Um, first thing for me is I need to understand or know that my child has the capacity and knows what to do to be able to get out the door on time. Yeah. So I might want to start asking a couple of questions before I start getting into, we're going to just do some problem solving here, and here's what's going to happen. Uh, by backing up and, and asking yeah. some some sort of capacity questions. And this happened with me on a call just recently uh, with, uh, with the parent I was coaching in this very scenario. And so I asked the mom, I said, so if I asked your daughter, what are the things that need to happen in order to get the out the door on time? What would your daughter say? And her response was, I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, so already we're backing this thing up to before we start holding accountable 
um, or holding our kids accountable for something, let's make sure that they know what the expectations are and that there's capacity to actually do it. Yeah, because there's so many times that we as parents think our kids know. We've done it since the day they were little, right? Yeah. These are the things that yeah. have to happen. Like, haven't you learned by osmosis? <laughs> <laughs> well, Stacy, you said a really key phrase just there, um, which is we've done it for them for so many years they should I know. Suppose. And I think that parents think because we've done it for them yeah. that somehow they know how to do it for themselves. But yeah. that's the big, to me, that's the big thing here is that as parents, we we can't let ourselves let our kids go on this because we haven't done the work to teach them what they are capable of doing themselves, but they don't know how yet because we haven't taught them. What is it? How do you get yourself out of bed on time? How do you get yourself out of bed by yourself? What do you do then? What do you do then? What would happen if mom or dad, and you can say this to an eight-year-old, right, Chad? What would happen if mom or dad uh, couldn't be here and it was up to you to get out the door and on the bus on time? What would you do first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on? And do our kids know the answer to that question? And have we taught them to do all those things? And those questions, uh, you know, they don't have to be heavy-handed or right. they're really curious questions. Again, it's like, let's dig in and understand your capacity here. What do you What do you know? What what have you learned by watching? And I think that's a that's a really good piece. If we weren't here, what would you do? What are all the things? And for some kids, that might be making a little bit of a list. Uh, for others, that's just intuitively they know, but now they're saying it out loud. Yeah. But we're, we're gaining information to understand what our kids can and can't do, and then offering opportunities that suggest to us what we need to yeah. grow in them in terms of skills. Can I impress you guys a little bit as a mom? Yeah. Please. I can remember times when my daughters had... No problem getting up when they had something fun that they wanted to do. Uh, really? Uh, yes. So they didn't need the list or me to talk through all of those things because right. they are big enough, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm kind of pushing back on the whole the parents didn't train them enough because they show that they can sometimes and they can't other times. And that's not, if, if you heard me say that you didn't train them well enough, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. What I am saying is that I want to understand what they know. You likely have done a marvelous job of training them. Okay. And, and, and it's, even, it's even a benefit of the doubt sort of thing uh-huh. um, where we're saying, well, let's at least have the conversation, and then we're going to figure out where we go from there. But my guess is that most kids will be able to answer that question with great accuracy. What does it need? What do you need to do in order to get out the door on time? Sure. What are the steps to successfully getting out the door on time? So mm-hmm. it's not about you haven't trained them. Mm-hmm. This is about understanding their perspective and what they know mm-hmm. uh, before we get into holding uh, uh, them accountable for something. Yeah, does that and make it, sense. It does, and it and it seems to me like it's a place of connection too. Like we're having an intellectual, maybe or just a calm conversation around the problem that we're having. And that feels really peaceful and good to me as a mom. Yeah, and asking, you know, why is it important? Yeah. Um, what's, what's the rationale for getting out the door on time? I mean, there's, there are lots of directions that this conversation could go. Yeah. And, and, you know, let's just say that, that those things are really clear. Yeah. And I mm. think that's kind of the, the next piece, right? Those things are now clear. Uh, the understanding of what it takes to get out the door on time is in place. And, and now it comes down to how do we help our kids be successful without bailing them out. And what I hear from lots of parents is this, this nagging, coaxing, mm-hmm. reminding, um, bribing, yeah. right? All the things <laughs> that, in essence, I, say, I think send the message to our kids, you are incapable, right? You're incapable because without Ooh. me nagging, coaxing, reminding, and bribing you, or you're irresponsible. Actually, I'm responsible for you getting to school on time. Mm-hmm. And so that's the wrestling match here a little bit, I think, is is being able to, to recognize who's actually responsible here, put the weight of the responsibility on the person that should be responsible for it, and now we're letting some natural impacts play out. Yeah. The question that's coming up in my mind is really practical. How do I know at what age you know, they can, they can be responsible for this on, for themselves. Yeah. You know, I think it's uh, paying attention to, to your kids. I don't know that there is a specific age. I think you look at your kids and you start to see, uh, like our firstborn was super responsible, was mm-hmm. getting up on her own, doing her own thing right away. You know, mm-hmm. it was like, it wasn't something that we even need to have conversation about because it was just taking place. Uh, and then our, our second born, much like me as a kid, um, you know, I, I would just kind of 
hold off. And, and if somebody else is going to take responsibility for me getting out of bed, um, then let them take responsibility for me because they tend, they tended to care more about the situation than I did. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah, their anxiety key, was driving that, right? That's a key idea, isn't it? Like, um, we want our kids to be responsible to do this, but then when they're not, we take over and we leave them depending on all of the things we do when we take over, and that becomes their mechanism. And so th- th- does this, I mean, I'm thinking to myself uh, of a new, a new idea around this, which is what if we taught parents to start with the alarm clock? Like what do you the, mean by that? Well, What's uh, the first uh, thing? <laughs> when the alarm goes off, whose job is it to respond to that? seven-year-old, six-year-old child, your alarm is going to go off to wake you up to start getting ready for school. When it goes off, whose job is it to make sure that you that it gets turned off and that you get out of bed? I love that idea because when my daughter was in kindergarten, that's what she got. She got an alarm clock as a present for starting yeah. school. And, and what parents will say is, yeah, their alarm goes off, they shut it off, and then I have to go in and wake them up. Do, do you? Do you have to go in and wake them up? Well, yeah, because if I don't wake them up, then they won't get going Mm -hmm. on time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, this will happen and this will happen and this will happen. And so your question back at the, or your your suggestion back at the beginning, Chad, about just helping children understand all of the factors. Do they understand the then what, then what, then what's that happen? If I don't come in and wake you up when your alarm goes off, what happens next? What will happen? And is that what you want to happen? And then what will happen? And instead of telling telling kids, telling kids, telling kids, asking kids, asking kids, asking kids, seems like pretty good approach to helping kids sort that out and understand it and then be willing to maybe put some tests in place around what we've just talked about. I think it also comes back a little bit to paying attention to what we want more of, right? So setting our kids up to be successful in small steps allows them to be successful in the next time and the next time. And so bite size, if you if you took the course of, you know, six weeks, the six steps to get out the door on time and you practiced one you practice the next, you practice the next over over some time. It doesn't guarantee that this is going to go away, but yeah. now you've taught the skills. They know the skills. Uh, they've they've shown that they can do the things that we want them to do. And I think that's a, that's a good place, you know, to get to, to start. Mm-hmm. So I want to take a little bit of a pause in here because I remember a very heated conversation I had at a mom's club at my school where the moms were really dealing with like sleep issues with their kids. And some of them had to go to the doctor and take their child to the doctor because their child was sleeping through the alarm clock and just completely solidly out. So we don't want to oversimplify in this conversation, right? Right, We don't. And so if your family is dealing with some of that and your kids are, then do what you need to to explore all the options of why your child is having a really difficult time getting up. This idea of starting with the alarm clock doesn't necessarily mean that now that you know what the alarm clock is, you're going to respond to it and do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. But it does mean that we're starting to build an understanding as we work with our ch- child around that. And if sleep is the issue, totally agreed. You know, we if if a child is not capable right now for some reason of waking up to the alarm, then uh, I think it's important for us to understand, like you said, what are the whys behind that? But then start working on concrete plans because if when they're in college, they have this issue and they can't get out of bed when the alarm goes off, too bad, so sad, right? Like like the professors don't hear that excuse very well. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And you know what? We just put out a blog post on our website. We found a study. There's a high percentage of parents who call their children in college to wake them up to get them to class. And why do you suppose they might need to do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's because that's what parents train their kids to need. Yeah. Um, how many people in my generation needed that? Like that was absolutely unheard of. Yeah. There was no phone in your dorm room, right? Yeah. Jim? And so. Uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> you didn't take that bite. <laughs> well, I was already thinking ahead. That, that was a joke. Stacy made a joke. I tried ha, to make ha. a joke. I had a phone in my dorm room. G13. <laughs> Come on. That's so good. Gosh. You know, I think we do this extreme and lofty thinking about all this and and extend it out to this big future. But if we start with the alarm clock, understand where we're at, help our kids at least articulate a language and start saying, well, if you can't get up or you don't hear it when it goes off, what do you need in order to get up? Um, So that if it's me to come in and shake them a little bit so that they do... Uh, and make sure their feet are on the ground and their T-shirt is on or whatever, then am I giving them the responsibility to tell me that's what they need? 
or am I just doing it for them? Mm -hmm. Because the more we do stuff for our kids that they can do for themselves, uh, the more we teach them to need that stuff that we do for them. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I I oftentimes encourage uh, in terms of language for for parents to use is, um, you know, inviting that, what do you need from me? How can I how can I be helpful in helping you be successful? You're responsible for this, um, but I'm I want to be a trusted, helpful guide and and caregiver for you. Uh, and then um, also being able to to frame it up a little bit. And here's what I'd be willing to do, right? And mm. uh, it's like, well, this is this is what I would be willing to do to to help. And because sometimes kids ask for way more than I would ever be willing to do. It's like, well, yeah, why don't you do this and then do this and then try that? And and now suddenly it feels like <laughs> I'm responsible again. Yeah. But here's what I would be willing to do. I'd be willing to come in one time, um, give you a quick back rub, turn the light on, and uh, put some music on for you. That's what I'd be willing to do. You know, how, how would that be? Or if that's something that we've come... I like that. ...come to agreement around. Uh, yeah. And now I'm doing something, not so, just saying it's your problem. Figure it out. So here's what I'm willing to do to help you. Mm-hmm. What would you like me to do to help you? Mm-hmm. So it's the you are responsible question. Mm-hmm. It's, it's uh, helping the child understand what you're willing and not willing to do as a part of their process of learning to take care of themselves a little bit more all the time. I mean, it all sounds really great, but when the rubber hits the road and you're like, okay, I've got an appointment to get to, or I've got a job to get to, and I can't be late, and all these other factors, the carpool is waiting for this kid, and all the inconveniences, all those things. I mean, I can start to feel the anxiety uh, even in those sorts of things. And and one of the ways in terms of just natural impacts, I think that that uh, it, it much of it depends on the, the parent's willingness or how much, sometimes I'll say to parents, how much pain and can you handle, right? I mean, how much how much can you handle here? There are lots of ways to teach your kids lessons, but you also have to be willing to do the thing that, you're say, that you say you're going to do mm-hmm. uh, because your kids are asking you in a lot of ways, can I trust you? Are you really going to do the thing that you say you're going to do? Or if it really gets hard... Are you going to bail me out here or, or make it easier for me? And so I think the, the idea of a child staying home, okay, and I'm not talking about f- five-year-olds, right? Mm-hmm. But I am talking about my junior high age kids when they were in junior high and, and I needed to get out the door and I was their ride. They didn't have a bus. I was the ride. And so you feel the tension. Yeah. And am I willing to allow that child to stay home? and then work with the school, this is something that I would want to do, to make sure that the school side of thing is also saying, hey, you're going to get some extra yep. work here, or yeah. there's something coming down the pipe for you because you didn't make it to class, and not as a reward, and every situation can be different, and I know there's lots of nuances, mm-hmm. but those are the kinds of things that, uh, for me, I ended up saying, I'll do one extra thing for you a month, Right, that I normally wouldn't do. So I'll give you like a freebie. If if it's in my sure. ability to make it happen, I'll do that. Beyond that, you're going to need to pay me an Uber fee, you know, or you're you're it's gonna there's going to be something that mm-hmm. you know that that comes out of this that allows you to feel some weight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, buying the ride was a big deal at our house. That really helped. Like if if you need a ride from me to get to school because you missed the bus then you can get a ride if I'm available and you'll have to buy it. And if not, we actually worked out ahead of time with our kids a contingency plan for if mom or dad weren't available to give the ride, what they would do if they missed the bus. Wow. And we had some neighbors that are willing to stand in there, but it, we told the neighbors it's not just a freebie. Even if your kid missed the bus, <laughs> you know, then our kids needed to know that they would need to do some sort of a chore or something extra in, in order to pay for that ride that they got if it wasn't money. But we, we had them pay us real money out of their allowance. So what I hear is you you put a system in place before it actually happened yep. so that they knew what to expect. And that was going to be then a natural consequence because it was the system yeah. that you had set up in your families. Yeah, there's no lectures. There's no I told you so's yep. or what's wrong with you. Or especially if the consequence lands and fits, then I think our, our kids eventually go, wow, my parents are really okay with this. Like, uh, you know, I'm happy to drive you to school for 10 bucks. Sure. I'm kind of rooting exactly. on you being late. I mean, oh, I could use I could use that money right now. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> and again, that's sarcasm. I can take I a friend to coffee. I don't want yeah. to, you know, our, our consequences lose their power when we're patronizing or sarcastic or, or any of those kinds of things. So yeah. that's not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. But there was a sense of, I'm, I can be okay if, yep. you, if, you, mm-hmm. if you don't make it. Yeah, and Chad, you're talking about consequences. And um, we've actually published a recent 
resource we want to take just a second here before we wrap up today to let people know about, and that's our Consequences That Really Work ebook. In our short ebook, Consequences That Actually Work, we will guide you to effectively use natural consequences, logical consequences, and restitution consequences that work to build your kids' wisdom and a genuine sense of responsibility for life at home and beyond your walls. To download our ebook, follow the link in our show notes. Let us know what impacted you most by leaving us a comment in this episode. So we've covered a lot of ground here today uh, around this question, what should I do when my child won't get up and get out the door on their own? Uh, and it's, it's a complicated issue, as every issue is, and there's no simple answer, as is always the case when we deal with these things. We want it to be simple. We wish it was simple. And yet there's some simpler ways to think about this, aren't there, that we've sort of reviewed um, that help parents. And what I've heard you say, Chad, is the simple way is... Um, to allow natural impacts to unfold, to help make sure, or not to help, but to do our work to make sure our kids understand what all those natural impacts are, what happens when, what happens when, what happens when, do you understand it, and then to do the work with your child to help them become responsible to start addressing those what happens when with their own behavior so that they're getting out the door on their own. But while we were on the little break, you said this thing that I think is really potent about, about the transfer of the weight of problems. And you said that beautifully. Can you repeat that kind of as a way to close w- what we're talking about here? Yeah, I think the, the uh, helpful framing for me around problem identification and ownership really is, um, is this. The parent that, or the, the person that cares the most about a particular issue tends to own the issue. They own that problem. So if the parent cares more about the child getting out the door on time and to school on time than the child cares about that, the parent has a problem. Hmm. Right? And so then the, the question really becomes, how do I get the weight of that responsibility and then the impacts of that that come with it to land on my child? Yeah. So hmm. they begin to, to experience and care more about getting to school on time than I do. So if I care more about my child getting out the door on time or about their grades or about their relationships or about them doing this, that, or the other thing than they care, then I'll tend to put more energy into solving it than they do, and the goal is is to help them care more somehow. And natural impacts is a way to help them do that. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think it also helps the parent move from the the bribing, lecturing, you know, overly responsible mm. and starts to place that weight on the child when they're like, oh, no, I need to get to class on time because if I don't... The teacher will do this or the principal will do this as opposed to mom or dad will do this. Correct. Right. Yep. Right. That's good. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. It's been a good day today. Good topic. Something that I know parents are dealing with often. And so I'm glad we addressed it. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Connected Families Podcast. We hope you got tips that you can use in your parenting today. Please subscribe and leave us a positive review so other families can find us and learn how to parent with peace and connection.